This is the Treatment Free Beekeeping Podcast. Welcome back to episode 63. I'm Solomon, your host. Today on the podcast, we have Aaron Brink from Altus, Oklahoma, and he is a sideliner beekeeper. He's already up to 120 hives, and he's only been doing this for three and a half years. So for those of you that think that uh, starting small is your only option, don't think that because there are other options, believe me. Anyway, we got some good stuff to talk about here today, so I'm just going to get out of your way and let you listen to it. Before that, I'm just going to say one thing about patrons. This podcast was actually recorded uh, during a live stream for the patrons on the TFB Pub, which patrons get access to. So if you'd like to become a patron of the podcast, head over to patreon.com slash TFB. Anyway, you can become a patron for as little as a dollar a month and get access to all that. And so if you were a patron, you would actually be able to be listening to me while I'm recording this right now. You get to see how all this is made and you get access before everybody else does. So if you want to do that, please do. Now, here is Aaron. Aaron, thanks for joining me on the podcast. Thank you, Sol- Solomon, for having me. Well, uh, I was someone, I forget who suggested you as a podcast guest, but I think there was something mentioned about having a bunch of hives and, and stuff like that. Is that you? Yeah. So I had, I, I was on the treatment free, uh, page and I had just, uh, you know, it, it's kind of funny when you look at, you know, different different beekeeping forums or pages on Facebook, you know, um, there's always the treatment, treatment free and non-treatment free. And, and, uh, you know, everybody talks about, you know, pros and cons and everything else. And, and, you know, what's always funny on the, uh, people that treat page, you know, um, or promote treating, they always talk about how treatment free beekeepers just lose bees all the time and uh, how they can't maintain large operations or grow. And, uh, You know, so what I did is I put a post up on the treatment free page, just asking a general question of, you know, how many of you are treatment free that have, you know, let's say 50 or 100 hives and how long have you had them? And I I think we got a got several of us to comment that, um, you know, we have over 100 hives and and have grown really well with that. Um, I myself uh, manage about 120. Um, As of right now, that's what I went into winter with. and uh, that's kind of how it came about, and I think you uh, you caught on to that and asked me and I think another gentleman to maybe uh, think about getting on the podcast. So I think that I think that's how that all came about. So yeah. ah yes, I think it was Corey Stevens. Do you know him? Yeah, I think so. Mm-hmm. Sweet. Yeah, he was the last episode or second to last episode. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Great. So. Uh, well, let's just. I I always ask how you got into beekeeping to kind of give people. Um, an idea of your mindset. So why don't you tell us how, like what, what brought you into beekeeping in the very beginning? So the funny story of how I got into it was, um, my wife was, is a uh, former air force and she had just, uh, deployed and, um, we had a rent house and we were renting it out to some young men, they were Air Force as well, and they decided to move out. And um, me and my wife decided just to move into that house. Well, when I moved in, I noticed that there was a, a beehive. There was a colony within one of the soffits of the house. And it really wasn't an issue the first year because we moved in in kind of the October time frame. But the following spring, um, between mowing the yard and um, trying to get to the water water hose spigot and it was just kind of in one of those areas of high traffic where we constantly walked in front of their main flight path and uh the other thing is being here in southwest oklahoma we've had africanized genes come through Mm -hmm. so some of our bees can be a little bit more testy than others around here um it just kind of depends on what you get into with uh, with the swarms around here, and uh, so these weren't really aggressive, but they just didn't like you getting getting near their front door. And uh, I got stung, I believe, twice, and then my son got stung 
three times one day and I had kind of just had it with it. And, uh, I've always been a honey lover. I love honey. Um, and, uh, so I'd kind of just had it with it and I was, I really started looking on what to do with them. I didn't want to kill them. I wanted to, you know, find a beekeeper to come get them. But, um, at that time there wasn't really anyone in town that was a large beekeeper actually did live extractions or live removals that everyone just wanted to kill them. So I had kind of put that on hold and uh, we'd kind of just like quarantined off that side of the yard. Um, and I was walking through Atwoods, um, kind of a farm and ranch store here in town and they had beekeeping supplies and, uh, a full hive set and, uh, you know, a jacket and veil and everything. And I said to myself, you know what? It can't be that hard to get these things out of the soffit. And uh, I thought that was going to go easy enough. And, of course, I kind of uh, jumped on YouTube and watched JP the Bee Man and a few others. And I thought, you know what? I can do this. And uh, that was a horrible mistake. Um, that first uh, removal out of our house didn't go so well. But I actually did end up getting the queen and, and 90% of the uh, colony and I still have that colony today. So that was my original colony, how I got into beekeeping. Um, from there, it just kind of snowballed. Um, I put a post up on Facebook showing me in the bee suit and a couple pictures my wife took of me getting them out of the house and then having the hive afterwards. And probably within a two-week time span, I probably had about 10 calls from different people saying, you know, I've got a swarm that landed in my tree or I've got, you know, a swarm in the an old barn out, you know, here or there. So I kind of threw around the idea of maybe getting, you know, maybe five or 10 hives. And, and, uh, my full-time job is I'm actually a personal trainer and, and uh, gym owner here in Altus, Oklahoma. And, uh, I thought, well, I could, you know, get some honey and sell it out of the gym. We sell other, uh, natural products out of the gym and, and, uh, supplements and stuff like that. And I thought, you know, having some natural raw honey would be awesome. So, Probably two months in, I had about seven hives between catching swarms and cutting them out of like old barns and stuff. And that's kind of how I got into it. And that's about what I overwintered my first year. And I kind of just fell in love with it. And um, so I believe that was three, three and a half years ago that that started. And uh, it's just really snowballed since. Um, but I'm really now I'm kind of pursuing more of a commercial side of beekeeping. Uh, It was a very fast progression from, um, I guess you would kind of call it a hobbyist mindset to a commercial mindset. Um, I just kind of saw the business side of it. And, uh, so that's what I'm pursuing now. So that's, that's kind of how I got into it. Um, wasn't anything drastic. One of the, one of the neatest things about getting into it was after I got my first hive, um, I went and visited my grandmother, um, in Norman, Oklahoma, and come to find out that my great-grandmother was actually a very large beekeeper in the 1950s and 60s. And we had in our family over 50 hives in the 60s, which back then was kind of a large number um, from what I've researched. And uh, anyway, they got out of it, um, but it's nice to kind of uh, look through family photo albums and see that that was done in the family before. And I uh, found some pictures of my mother and my, my aunts holding uh, frames and, and going through the hives and stuff. So anyway, that's kind of just a, I guess, a quick, uh, maybe not a quick, but story of how I got into it. So, yeah. Well, we got an hour, so don't worry about it too much. <laughs> I got you. So that yeah. was three and a half years ago, you said? Yeah. Yeah, I believe that was, well, I guess. I guess, yeah, it was in May time frame that that happened, that I took the took the bees out of the hive uh, that was out of the colony that was in our soffit. So, yeah, I'd say that about three and a half years ago. So, yeah. Can you give us a, a like a year by year of how you progressed from taking a hive out of a soffit up to 120 <laughs> yeah. colonies? So, um, I'm kind of a, I, I'm a research guy in, in just in my heart. I love reading research. I love um, looking at the numbers of things. I'm very much a number guy. Um, you know, we, we utilize so many numbers in personal training and, and of course, nutrition and, and supplementation. It, you kind of have to. Um, but I'm just a very big research guy. And um, the way I started looking at things with my hives um, is I, I looked at a hive and what a, you know, a, I, I took the numbers of the, nat- the 
the average amount of honey produced by a hive in Oklahoma, which is around 30 pounds, um, is what the general average is. Um, and I said, well, if I can produce 30 pounds per hive and I have 10, 10 hives and they all produce in a year, that's 300 pounds, and I can sell that at, you know, um, we actually have a fantastic honey market where I am. I can, I can generally sell a pound for about $15. Um, which is way higher than most people sell their one pound uh, squeeze bottles for in most places. But um, here, for some reason, we just have kind of that mindset. The farmer's market is awesome. And when I showed up the time at the farmer's market, they they were selling, selling, um, I want to say they were selling a half gallon jar for like 60 or $70. I mean, it was crazy, the prices that they were getting on it. So we have a great market where I am. So I was kind of looking at what, to me, it was kind of a side business that I could, you know, pedal out of my gym. Um, and a lot of my clients were interested in it. So after that first year, I believe I, uh, let me look at my notes. I overwintered um, seven full colonies, and uh, I consider a full colony uh, two deeps. Uh, at least I did on my first year. And I had like two small nucleus hives, so I guess nine total. Um, and I lost those two smaller ones. Um, over the winter, but those were late swarms that I had caught that year. Um, so I ended up splitting and I believe I caught or extracted another 20 to 25 hives that second year. Um, and, um, so that took me up there, you know, in the thirties and forties number. Um, and, uh, I produced a good amount of honey that second year, um, and at that point, I hadn't bought any bees at all. So these were all local swarms and local captures. Um, so, and that was how I really wanted to kind of maintain things um, until I started um, getting into some Africanized honeybees, which down here in southwest Oklahoma, when I say southwest Oklahoma, the Texas border is only, you know, uh, 20 miles away. So, I mean, we're way down here. Um, and we've had quite a few African genes come through. Um, there was actually eradication programs down here um, years ago because uh, they were so bad. Um, but uh, so up until that point, I hadn't bought any queens, hadn't bought any bees. I had just these raw captures that second year. Um, going into my third year last year, um, I did a ton of splitting. Um, but I had also done a lot of research into uh, Michael Palmer's um, research on creating uh, brood factories and brood bombs, being able to look at your colonies and um, you look at your weak colonies and you look at your strong colonies and you can look at a weak colony and, and look at it and say, okay, well, this isn't going to produce honey this year. So what can I utilize out of it as resources? Um, and for me, I looked at it in that sense of this is probably a colony that's not going to overwinter. Um, but during the growing season, I can utilize the resources that it's going to provide um, and apply those to other hives for honey production or brood production um, or just to build out hives, um, have drawn comb, wax production. So those were things that I looked at, and I really enjoy um, Michael Palmer's research and what he does with brood factories and, and uh, pulling brood, uh, which is what I do with a lot of my weaker colonies. So that's what I did my third year. Last year, I did a lot of, I would say, manipulation um, within my hives. Um, and the, the biggest thing I saw with that was if you can still a frame of capped brood, um, you know, if you look too much into capped brood, there, there's really no allegiance on capped brood. Once it, once it hatches, it just becomes, you know, part of the colony. So you can still cap brood from any hive and give it to another hive, and there's really no repercussions of that as long as you've shaken all the bees off of it. Um, so I did a lot of that last year of manipulation, and I was able to do uh, a lot of splits and create a lot of um, just a lot of excess hives last year. Um, the great thing that we have here in southwest Oklahoma is we have really three major flows throughout the year. We have a, a massive spring flow. We have a lot of elm trees where we are here, so we have a massive pollen bloom early. And, you know, we'll have pollen within the next two weeks. Our first pollen will come probably by February 15th. So we have a huge, huge um, push at the first of spring. 
And then March and April, um, we have sand plums that are just everywhere throughout the countryside. We also have uh, bindweed and a lot of roadside plants um, that really bloom out and have high nectar yields. Um, so we have, if you have a strong colony, you can make a, a small honey crop in early spring. And then we also have a ton of China berry trees that bloom uh, like mid-June. Um, and that makes a huge honey crop as well, huge pollen flow. But the crazy thing about all the crops that are planted here, like we have cotton, cotton blooms in July. And what that does is a lot of times is there's, it's such a huge amount of nectar that comes into the hives that um, we uh, – and what's funny about how I progressed was my first year I tried to go completely foundationless. Um, and I learned quickly that I wasn't an expert at that. <laughs> and, uh, I had a lot of wild comb and wild boxes and, uh, had to do a lot of, uh, basically cutouts out of my boxes because I just didn't know how to manage that. And then my second year, I did a lot of starter strips and, um, it, it's a method by Ken Davis and I believe by, uh, Don, the fat bee man where, uh, he's on YouTube. I'm, I'm sure everybody knows or maybe knows of him, but he does a fishing line method uh, where he makes an X out of fishing line within the frame to hold foundation in. I tried that out, and that it just doesn't work for us down here because our temperatures get to 105, 110, and when bees are bringing in you know pounds worth of nectar a day, um, you end up with fresh comb that's laden with with uh, nectar, and it ends up just collapsing in the hive. So um, last year I started a process of, of changing everything out to plastic foundation. Um, my first two years I was really not hot at all on plastic foundation just because um, I really wanted to be as, as natural as I possibly could. But even with wired foundation, uh, my second year I was having problems with uh, comb collapsing in hives just because of the temperatures. And I mean, I have all, most of my boxes are painted you know, white and still the temperatures just get so high and that's with added ventilation. That's, you know, where you, you crack a box, you know, you, you set a box, a half inch, the second box, a half inch off the top one to allow more ventilation. And it just, it's just too hot down here. It just, it just doesn't work. So we've, this, this last year, I really switched more towards plastic, um, and learned some tricks of the trade to get bees to draw out on plastic. But, uh, the end of, of last year, um, I split uh, right before the cotton flow, and that's what got me to the 120 mm. hives. And I try to split directly before a major nectar and pollen flow happens. Um, and what that allows is it allows the bees to, um, if, if you look into research, when bees go queenless, um, from what I've found, um, they kind of almost go into overdrive in terms of foraging. And uh, so what I do is I kind of time that to split so that they bring in a huge amount of pollen and nectar. There's plenty of pollen and nectar in the hive for them to raise queen cells. And uh, so I like to do fall splits. But that also allows me to, um, most of my hives, even my splits, if they're in a nuke box, to walk into winter with, you know, 30 to 40 pounds worth of honey, which is what's recommended for overwintering here in Oklahoma is at least 30 pounds of, of honey to overwinter a hive. So that's kind of how I've got here. I do a lot of manipulation, a lot of, um, oh, I would say condensing. Um, and when I walked into fall, e each year when I walk into fall, I condense down hives. If I look at a hive and I know that it's not going to, um, make it through the winter, um, I don't just drag out the inevitable. Um, I go ahead and, you know, kind of uh, force natural selection on them. Um, but uh, that normally works out really well. So that's kind of how I've got here. Um, but I have a lot of, I would say, against the grain ideas and management practices that I do, um, especially when I combine hives. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about newspaper transfers and, you know, uh, double screen boards and all of these things. And, and, uh, I found that none of those things are necessary. Um, I, I just smoke each hive that I'm going to combine extremely hard, um, to cause mass disarray within the hive. And then I just stack the two boxes on top of each other and 
I've never had an issue with queens getting killed. Normally, the weaker queen always gets killed by the stronger colony. This is what I found. Um, I think I had one instance last year where it didn't, and both queens were killed. Um, and then I just combined again with another hive, and I ended up with like a, a triple deep hive that was just a monster. Um, but uh, so yeah, that's kind of how I've got got here. I'm sure that's a ton of information, but uh, <laughs> and I'm kind of all over the place. I have severe attention deficit, so I kind of uh, go all over the place when I do when I do. Uh, well, I guess when I talk a little bit. So yeah, that's that's kind of how I've got where I am. Well, that's not a problem because then I can go ahead and write down some notes and ask you questions about it later. Yeah, awesome, awesome. So pursuant to that, let's start with uh, with the brood bombs. Can you give us some ideas on how exactly you you do that? What you do? How it works out? The benefits, etc. So, so where that came from was. Um, and, and he's on YouTube. You can look him up, and he's got several papers and, and other things written. But his name is Michael Palmer, and um, he's done a lot of uh, what he calls brood factories and brood bombs. And basically what you do is you look through the hives within your apiary, and you you single out your weaker hives. And when you single out your weaker hives, you're looking, of course, okay, well, they've had – two months worth of nectar and pollen and they still just aren't growing. So you're either, you're, you know, nine times out of 10, you're probably looking at a poorly mated queen or, um, a, a queen that's kind of at the end of a run. Um, and that's the problem with doing cutouts and, and catching swarms is you have no idea the age of the queen that you've caught. And especially if you've, if you've, if you've caught a swarm with a mated queen, nine times out of 10, you've probably got a queen that, overwintered in a, in a, in a nearby hive. So she's at least, you know, one to two years old. Um, and she's gone through a winter. Um, now sometimes you get swarms with virgin Queens or, or mated and virgin Queens and that happens. But from what I've caught, the majority of it is, uh, I've, I've caught mated Queens and you, you really don't know their age. Um, so I go through and I, I pinpoint those hives, those hives that are weak. And, um, I, you know, if, if they've made it, three months into the growing season, um, for us or into the, the, the flow for us. Um, I just kind of, you know, write them off. I don't, I don't see how they're going to make it through the winter if they haven't already put in 30 pounds worth of honey. Um, so what I do is I go in and, um, I run everything off of numbers. So if, if I've got a single box that's full of bees, but it's a weaker hive and it's all drawn comb, what I like to do is, let's say I've got another, let's say I've got a hive I want to make what I call a production hive. I want to make a honey crop off of our July uh, or our, our June china berries or our July uh, cotton crop. So what I do is I look at this weak hive and I look at this strong hive and I decide that I'm going to be stealing capped sealed brood from my weak hive and I'm going to be giving it to my stronger, what I want to make into a production hive. So basically what you do is you go in and you find at least one to two frames of sealed capped brood every 21 days from your weaker hive. And of course that's your, your, you know, hatch out rate within that hive. Um, so that way you're not diminishing the weaker hive. You're just not allowing it to grow. And you already knew that it wasn't going to grow to begin with. Something's going on within that hive. Now, yeah, you could do things like requeen or allow them to raise a new queen, but I look at that as a numbers game too. If I'm already two months into the growing season, um, where we are, we have a growing season of what's considered um, 235 days. So, and that's a nice thing you can look up too. And this might be a, a nice note for everyone to look on, look at. You can get online and you can Google um, average growing season for your area. And it will give you a detailed uh, analysis of when your temperatures get above, you know, 40 degrees, um, when first pollen comes out, um, when last pollen comes out, when the first freeze happens. Um, and nine times out of 10, something wherever you are, anytime from that first pollen bloom till freeze, there's going to be something that's forageable for your bees. And that's how I run my year, my management practice. So I know that I have 235 days 
And if I divide that out by 21 days, which is, you know, the life cycle of a worker, um, and depending on temperature can even be quicker than that. They can hatch out at 19 or 20 days, depending on how hot it is outside. Um, I've seen that here where I, you know, watched, you know, um, brood be sealed and 19 days later, the whole frames hatched out because it's 110 degrees out. Um, so it's kind of like with queen cells, they can hatch out at, you know, a sooner time than you think they would. Um, especially if you're raising queens, you got to kind of watch that. But, um, so what I do is I, I still brood every 21 days from those weaker hives and I give it to the stronger colonies. Now, if you think about it, you're basically just creating a bomb of nurse bees within this new, what I'm going to call my, my production hive. So what you've done is you've created this massive, and if you've got two or three wheat colonies, you can still, you know, four to six frames worth of sealed capped brood and give it to this, um, what I call production colony. Now, the only time I do that is right before a major nectar flow. And uh, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm loading that hive down with nurse bees. They're also going to be the age uh, that they can produce wax. So if I only have foundation to put on for a honey super, I know that those young nurse bees are going to be able to draw out that entire super worth of wax as long as it's a good enough flow. But um, they're probably also going to fill it with honey because the foragers don't have to worry about building out wax because there's a bomb that just went off of all these new younger bees. And the only thing you have to worry about that is you have to be careful um, because you don't want that hive that you just added a massive population boost into to swarm. Um, so what I normally do is anytime I do like four to six frames worth of sealed brood, I add two, however many boxes I have, I double up after I do that before the nectar flow so that there's just a, a massive amount of room for them to grow into. Um and I do actually use uh, queen excluders sometimes with uh, exterior entrance. So I'll have the top box have a hole drilled in it um, so that the foragers can enter through that, that secondary entrance and not have to go through the entire hive. So that's what I do with brood bombs. Um, but the other nice thing with that, too, is if you just have, um, if you have sealed brood, 90% of it, you can make a split with that because what you do is you pull a frame, you ensure that your queen's not on the frame. Now, let's say you have a five-frame nuke box. You can go to these weaker hives within your apiary. At least this is what I do. And you can go and pull, let's say, four frames worth of sealed brood out. And you can make sure that there's no queens on those. And you can go to this new... Um, this new split that you're wanting to do and you can shake all of the nurse bees off of this sealed cap brood down in there and the foragers are going to take flight. But what I've noticed um, with nurse bees, and this is, I don't know that if, I don't know if anyone's ever said this, but this is just kind of my belief. I don't believe nurse bees have loyalty to the hive. They have loyalty to the brood. So, um, they're not going to attack each other. They're just going to be worried about their brood. And I've ne never seen nurse bees uh, sting each other or attack each other. They just automatically crawl back up to the brood and try to cover it as quickly as possible. So what I'll do is I'll take four frames of brood from weaker hives, put it in a five-frame nuke box, put one frame of foundation in there, uh, shake two to three frames worth of bees in, and then you can either give a, a newly mated queen or give like a queen cell to hatch out and uh, you just created a new hive. And that's what I do. Um, so generally what you did is you stole the resources that those weak hives were providing, but you're not continuing that weaker genetic line um, because you're not, in, unless they raise their own queen cell, um, you're not, you're not allowing those genetics to continue on throughout your apiary. Um, but I, I view it that way because I know these, these hives aren't going to make it through winter anyway unless I do something just drastic, like steal honey from other hives, which I, I don't particularly like to do. Which is um, the reverse thing as you're trying to do. Do what? Which is the reverse thing that you're trying to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to produce as much honey as I possibly can uh, um, because, I mean, let's be honest, the resource that bees are after that allow them to survive are 
is pollen and, and, and honey. And if you have that in abundance, then you can make things happen in, in, in your bees and in your hives and your colonies that otherwise wouldn't happen. So if you're constantly trying to feed or take care of or steal resources from your stronger hives to give to weaker hives, it, it's just a revolving door of you still have these weak genetics or these weak weak genetic lines that that you probably don't want breeding anyway. Um, and a lot of times what I'll end up doing with those, especially if, um, if I feel like, especially when I get to the end of the season, um, I take those weak hives and I may not even, um, I may not even just combine them. I may just take all the frames out of them and dump all the bees in front of a queen right hive and all the, all the nurse bees will just cr- climb right inside that queen right hive. The foragers will take flight and try to fly back to their original hive. But after two or three days, they'll end up just, you know, mixing in with all the hives that are nearby. Um, the queen, she'll be lost and probably die on her own. So I like doing that. I've never really seen swarms happen that way because there's so much disarray because you lost all the nurse bees and all the foragers try to take flight and go back to the original location. So, um, I do a lot of different things that's kind of against the grain. And, and what's funny is when I talk to older beekeepers, they kind of, you know, gasp and, and, and give me the stink eye and kind of give me the look of death of, you know, we've never done things that way. And that's crazy. Um, but to me, I, I just look at it as you're, you're just, you're making things that would happen in nature happen a lot faster. Um, but you're also allowing the bees the best opportunity for success. Um, and I think that happens so much is so many beekeepers want every one of their hives to survive when you need to look at it in, in terms of there's going to be natural selection at some point. And why would you, why would you allow that to go further than it needs to, you know, because ultimately to me, you're just wasting resources. If I let a hive die through winter, all of its pollen and nectar and everything else is probably going to get robbed out anyway. Because our winter here in southwest Oklahoma, like in December, we had 70-degree days. So on a 70-degree day in December, if there's a dead out, there's not going to be anything left of it. So I just wasted all those resources anyway. So, yeah. So those are brood bombs and what I kind of do with them. Um, I normally only do it with sealed brood. Because if you do do things like that with open brood, you leave yourself open for opportunities where queen cells can happen and swarms can happen. Um, you know when you put sealed brood in um, and there's not a lot of eggs on it that you don't have to look for a whole lot of queen cells, but also you know that those bees aren't going to be taking flight for a couple weeks. They're going to be focused on taking care of brood, cleaning cleaning the hive, and building wax. So I know at least for a couple weeks I don't have to worry about a swarm. And if you do that Generally, before a major nectar flow, you just increase your odds of a good honey crop, you know, by tenfold because you just put a massive, you know, boost in the population of that hive. So, so yeah, those are my brood bombs. That's kind of um, not my idea. That's Michael Palmer's idea. I just kind of bounce off of it. So, yeah. So that's them. There's the only, I guess, the only comment that I would have in response to that is, um, I kind of like to keep the, uh, the queens, the queens, you know, if I, if I'm combining a hive, I like to find the queen, give her a quick pinch and stick her in my pocket, which is interesting because yeah. sometimes you'll find queens in your pocket. So there's that. Yeah. But, well, um, and, uh, I do try to save queens sometimes if, um, but one of my biggest things that I do with my management is I'm, I'm a huge time guy. I try to, uh, mitigate as uh, time as, as wisely as I possibly can when I go out to my hives. Um, just because I have another full time business, um, uh, running the gym. I mean, we run classes all the way from 6 a.m. until eight o'clock at night. So, um, the few hours I have in between that are free, I've got to kind of be on the ball. Um, I understand. But, you know, a lot of times when people pull queens too, is they'll pull a queen and then they'll and I've seen this several times is they'll have a weak hive, they'll pull a queen. And then, um, I had, I saw this happen several times last year. They'll pull a queen and then offer it, you know, to someone else. And, 
I don't really get the, uh, I guess if you want to make $30 real quick, you could do that. But to me, you're just giving someone a queen with bad genetics or is maybe at the end of her life. And then you, you're just sending your problem down the road and, and yeah, uh, I wouldn't do that for sure. <laughs> yeah. It was something I saw several times last year where people, you know, would comment, well, I bought this queen from so-and-so and she lays terrible and, and blah, blah, blah. And, 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 you know, I kind of hate that for people, but you got to kind of think like, well, did they pull a weak queen and combine a hive and try to make an, a, an easy buck at the end of the day? And, you know, um, 90% of those things probably, that probably never happened. But, you know, I, I, it's just one of those things where, um, I've seen it happen and I, uh, you know, anyway, I understand. Enough, but, uh, but yeah, I, I, I do and I will try to pull a queen. Um, what I have noticed, a few of the weaker hives, and this is one thing I really like to do if if you have a nuke box or a smaller colony, is a lot of times if you'll inspect a queen of a weaker colony, a lot of times I've noticed that there's something wrong with them. They're missing a leg. They're missing an antenna. They're missing you know, a wing. Um, and you got to think that that's going to have repercussions on her and her lay, laying ability. And, and also the ability of the, the workers to allow her to lay, you know, they'll probably want to kill her half the time. So it's one of those deals. But, uh, but yeah, so. And I kind of, I kind of do somewhat of the same thing. I'm not sure if I got it from, from Palmer or not. It's been a few years since I've read up on Palmer's stuff. So, I mean, mm-hmm. I have, I have, I know I'm familiar, but it's been, you know, you know how when you, you read something and then a few years later you get, an idea about something and then later on you figure out it was actually somebody else's idea first. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anyway. (laughs) So, um, what, so what I do is, uh, one of two things happens with those really weak hives. I will, um, either take the, take all the brood from a really weak hive and smash the queen and use that as a nuke and start nukes with it. Yep. Or in some cases, uh, for maybe middling hives kind of, you know, not weak, but not strong. I will take all but one frame of open brood and, and all the brood and all the, uh, workers that I can get my hands on. And th- those will go into new nukes as well. And then I'll let that, hive try and build back from that one frame and sometimes they'll actually um they will supersede their queen and they'll be they'll build up and be fine for winter other times they'll just you know dwindle and die in which case uh, they'll get combined with somebody else yeah yeah that's what i've noticed with uh when i when i do a lot of combines with um we get a ton of water meter cutouts out here where bees will a small swarm will get into a water meter i i probably did 30 or 40 of them last year and i never allow them to try to build out an entire hive because it's normally only one pound of bees and a queen and they were you know it's just not enough bees to really get going especially if you get a midsummer um but uh what i just end up doing is i'll i'll just uh i don't try to keep those queens i'll i'll what I'll do is I'll put four or five of them in nuke box boxes and I'll see who's really going, going to town lane and, and who's a good looking queen. And I'll, you know, I'll condense down from there. Kind of like what you're talking about. You'll just, you know, combine things as you need to, or still brood, you know? So yeah, absolutely. Okay. New function. I, now that we are, um, why is audacity doing this to me? It suddenly developed a function where if the volume goes too high, it will cut the volume overall on me and it's changing my volume. Anyway, my problem, not yours. Uh, this is the first episode where I am live streaming the, um, podcast recording on my TFB pub, which is a group, closed group on Facebook for supporters of the podcast. Absolutely. And Absolutely. this is an opportunity for them to ask questions also. So Jeff asks, yep. what are the tricks you were talking about to get the bees to draw out on plastic? So I actually, um, I just did a, a Facebook live video about this the other day. Um, 
one of the biggest things, and what's funny is it, it, this is actually all over the internet, and it's it's literally mentioned in, I would say, I would say it's mentioned probably in every forum um, that you can look on. Someone will talk about plastic, and then someone will either mention, you know, you just need more wax, and um, that's what we do. So what I noticed um, with plastic foundation, I had some my first year. Um, but I didn't like it a whole lot. And what's funny is I actually ended up buying a bunch of frames from Atwoods and they came with plastic foundation. And I, I, I kid you not, I probably threw away like 80 sheets of plastic foundation my first year. And I, I constantly kick myself for it. Um, but, uh, what I do is, um, what you need to do is get some extra wax. You need about one pound of wax per 10 frames of plastic foundation. And you want to try to get treatment-free and, and as clean as you can. If there's a little bit of sediment in it, it's not going to matter because the bees will, you know, end up building with it anyway. Um, but what I do is I get a cheap crock pot. I'll go to a garage sale um, or you can find you can find a really small, cheap one um, at Walmart that's like $10. And I just I leave that to to my wax. So you take about one pound of wax per 10 frames, um, and you can stretch it a little bit more, um, but that's just kind of a general rule of thumb that I've found and what I've seen people post. Um, but you get a crock pot, you turn it on low, and you put your one pound of wax in there. Um, you're going to need to give it like an hour or two for it to fully melt. Um, once it melts down, you get just a cheap paintbrush or a cheap... Uh, I've used a roller, but I'm not so hot on the roller because the rollers normally are made out of some type of plastic. And if they get too hot, they'll just melt. Uh, so I like a paintbrush, a regular like horsehair paint, paintbrush, or the really cheap ones at Walmart. Um, they're like 97 cents. Um, and what you do is, is get some wax on that brush. And the biggest thing with plastic foundation is you want to recoat the entire sheet of plastic with wax. So you just kind of paint on an extra layer of wax. Um, and when you, when you do it thick enough, it'll actually look like you're, like when bees start building out foundation, you'll see little edges coming up out of, out of the comb, uh, embossing off of the plastic. And once you get to that point, that's, that's where you want to stop. But the biggest thing is making sure, um, you know, with plastic foundation, one of the biggest things is bees don't like to build out to the absolute edge of where the wood meets the plastic. So you really have got to make sure that those edges are waxed extra really well. Um, as long as the edges are waxed really well, they'll pretty much build out the entire frame um, of foundation. Um, but I go ahead and just wax all the, all the uh, foundation really well. So about one pound will cover... 10 frames. Um, and that's what we do. Um, and as long, uh, I mean, every single frame that I've done that way, they draw out. And the nice thing too, is you're, you're putting extra wax into the hive. So what they can do is they can collect that off the frames and they can utilize it to help build out, you know, a frame in the middle or wherever you, you know, wherever they're trying to build in, in the hive at that time. Um, and what's funny is when I leave boxes of those frames out that have the extra wax, my bees swarm it and they'll collect the wax off of it and take it back to the hive. So they, they obviously want it and they obviously want to utilize it and they love to build out on it. So that's what we do. That's what I do to get them to build on plastic. And I've never had an issue with them, uh, not accepting that. Um, I think what I've, what I've read and what I've heard and, and, because I looked into a little bit of research on it. Um, evidently, from what I've read, is that the bees like to have the filling of wax underneath their feet. And if plastic doesn't have enough of, of a waxy coating, um, the bees just reject it and they don't want to build on it. Um, you know, and that's, that's kind of, you know, when I do swarm traps, if you ever forget to put a frame in there, they always put their first comb right where, you know, right where you forgot it. And if you ever do that again in the same exact place, they'll always build it in the same exact place. And it's just because there's still, I think there's still fragments of wax there, you know, and I think it has scent that they, you know, can, can find and utilize and they just go there. But that's what we do for plastic foundation. 
Uh, it's really easy. And the nice thing is, too, if you have to buy frames in bulk or foundation in bulk, you can buy unwaxed plastic foundation at about 20 to 30 cents cheaper per sheet without wax coated on it. And then you can coat the wax on yourself. And if you have your own wax, then it's just free for you. So you're saving yourself 20 to 30 cents per sheet of plastic foundation um, if you wax them yourselves. So that's what we do. Yeah. And what brand do you use? Um, Date Ant. I get most of my stuff from Date Ant. Um, I good friends um, and I, I wouldn't say business partners, but we do a lot of business together. Uh, Travis Atkins, who owns BDY's LLC. He's a data uh, supplier and distributor. Um, so he's only about an hour, 15-minute uh, drive from me. Um, every other major supplier, Man Lake and all, all those guys, distributors, they're two or three hours away from me. We're kind of out in the middle of nowhere. So you have to ship everything in um, if you want to ship stuff. So I just have Travis order all of my stuff, and I go pick it up. So I, I really like the data amp frames and, and the data amp foundation. Um but this year I'll be trying out some Man Lake Foundation because they have and they offer small cell plastic foundation, whereas Date Ant does not, uh, from to my knowledge. And I really want to try that out, um, especially uh, because of I want to try to be as, as treatment free as possible. And there has been some research into smaller cell size and how it helps with uh, controlling the Varroa mite and and some other things. Um, you know, the common foundation used now has, you know, 5.1 to 5.4 cell size, and that's not the natural cell size of honeybees. That was a that was done years ago to produce a larger bee um, in an effort to think that larger bees will forage and consume and produce more honey. Um, but the same could be said for small cell foundation because you're going to have, you know, a higher percentage of bees being born per sheet of foundation because of the smaller cell size. So yeah, that's what we do for foundation. That's the brand I use right now, but this next year I'll be experimenting with some small cell and kind of trying to get some ideas on, on whether it has any effect on Varroa counts um, within my hives. So yeah. This is some good stuff because I have myself tried the, uh, the man Lake frames and I've been having a bit of trouble with them. I uh, just posted recently on the Facebook group about how uh, many of my frames, my man lake frames are not in hives right now because those hives have died. Um, I haven't had too many problems with getting them to be accepted. Man lake frames come coated with wax. I think it's sprayed on. It doesn't look like it's, um, yeah. it doesn't look like it's painted on. I believe most manufacturers spray them on. You know, from what I know, you can order from Acorn and they'll double spray them or double dip them. And you can, and, and Man Lake and Data Ant both offer um, like a, a double layer of, of wax, but it's twice the price. Right. And, and me, you can just paint it on, you know, yeah. um, have your own wax, which I mean, I'm, I'm in my bee workshop right now. I think I'm staring at like 50 pounds worth of wax. So nice. I, I have all the wax in the world. <laughs> I give, I yeah. guess that gives me another incentive to finish the construction on my new solar wax melter. Yeah, absolutely. So I can process that stuff. Absolutely. Um, go ahead. All right. Uh, let's move on to the next question. Um, let's see, which question should I do? Out of my own curiosity, because I am a civil engineer and worked on some projects in uh, Wichita Falls with their um, potable reuse, you have any? Have you been having any problems with droughts in your area in the recent years? So, um, up until three years ago, we had had a seven-year drought, and uh, the lake that actually supplies our drinking water um, was classified Lake uh, Lake Luger. Um, and Lake Tom Steed, they both supply our drinking uh, water. They were both uh, literally classified as dead lakes, and we were having uh, severe issues on whether uh, the city of Altus was going to make it. Um, our farmers weren't able to irrigate for seven years due to that drought. So, yeah, we, we've had some major issues with it in the recent years. Um, it's just been the last three years that we've actually had uh, ridiculous amounts of rain. Um, this last year's cotton crop was 
um, the largest production year that's ever happened that I know of in Jackson County. And they're expecting this next year to be even larger than that. So, but yeah, yeah, we've had some severe issues with drought lately, um, within the last 10 years. So has that, that's before you really started beekeeping though. That's so that really hasn't really before I started you. beekeeping, but I, I can tell you, you know, I'm, I'm an outdoorsy guy. I like to hunt. I like to fish. I like to do a lot of things outdoors. And I, and I can tell you, um, you know, I've always found nature is beautiful and, uh, I'm always outside a lot. And I, I can tell you just kind of thinking back, I like to hike a lot. I've seen twice as many bumblebees, twice as many honeybees probably in the last three years than I have years before that. And, and of course we had major die offs with, with other animals around here. Our, our deer herd was just massively impacted. You know, I think they, I think they counted a 50% loss in Jackson County alone in the deer herd. Um, and, in, and, and everything was affected. It was awful. You live um, in Jackson County? Yeah. Jackson County. I live in Jackson County. <laughs> gotcha. We have plenty of deer in, uh, in Colorado. Correct. Uh, I'm in Oregon now. Oregon. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, that's funny. I'm, I'm, uh, within the, within the next year, we're actually going to be moving to Washington. So there'll be a whole lot of changes in, in our lives the next, next year and a half. But, Interesting. uh, I'm actually, I'm actually going to be leaving, uh, 90% of the beekeeping operation here in Oklahoma. And I'll be taking a little bit with me up to Washington, um, but I'll be back down here throughout the year uh, multiple times to be taking care of the bees. So, so are you gonna uh, are you gonna start over and try and do the same thing in Washington, or or leave it mostly in Oklahoma? I'm gonna leave it mostly in Oklahoma, um, and the reason I'm looking at that is basically um, the area that, and, and like I said, this is where you got to kind of you know if you to me if you're gonna be very successful in anything. You've got to kind of do your research. And, um, for me wanting to get honey crops and to be a successful beekeeper, the biggest thing that affects bees is weather. You know, if it rains, you've lost out on nectar and pollen. Um, if it's overcast and cold, you've lost out on foraging days. Um, so I started looking at where we're going to move and they're actually about, um, they're at about 82 days longer in winter than we are down here. So, you know, you're, you're looking at a huge chunk of time that, uh, that you're, you're looking at bees that aren't going to be foraging. Um, so the way I looked at it is, um, it's one of those things where I think they're going to be more successful down here. I'm going to take probably 20 hives with me up there to start with and see how they do up there. Um, but the majority I'm going to be leaving down here. So, and this year, I plan on splitting everything I have at least um, at least one strong split. If not, I I plan on splitting three ways, depending on how things are going to look come this spring. Um, but I did I did a lot of things over wintering differently this year. Um, so so yeah, that's kind of on the since you have ex- since you have experience with uh, foundationless. Let's talk about that for a little bit. Um, yeah. In my polling of treatment free beekeepers on Facebook, it seems like around 75% of treatment free beekeepers at least use either some foundationless or all foundationless. And that includes different hive types, you know, top bars and worry and whatnot. So can you give us your experience on foundationless and kind of walk us through how that worked out for you? So I really, really liked um, the fact that I could do foundationless and, and, and I had great success with it up to the point of, um, within my honey supers, um, especially with cotton crops. And it happened the first year that I, uh, I really made large crops with the, the cotton flow. When I say a large crop, I'm talking a, a hundred pounds worth of honey, um, coming into a hive. Um, we're talking massive crops of, of honey and, and I run everything in deeps. So when you have a deep frame of honey, it's quite of an quite an expanse of of comb that's laden with 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 pollen. And if they haven't hardened it yet, that's a whole lot of weight um, and pressure up there on on comb that hasn't been hardened. Um, and it's just vir- what I call virgin comb. It hasn't ever had a, a brood cycle through it. Um, 
So um, for me, I really loved it. And if I was in a different climate, I would absolutely try to do it. Um, but what I noticed with, at least for me, um, when I got those large honey crops in, what would end up happening is two to three, four, even the whole box would end up collapsing on 100, 105 degree days in the middle of summer, especially in August. You know, August is our hottest month. So you're already past really the the cotton bloom and you're into a whole nother month of just super hot weather. And what would end up happening is that that super would end up collapsing. And of course, when you have collapse, you know, 40 pounds worth of honey that collapses in a hive and you don't catch it for three days to a week, then you'll have hive beetles, wax moths. You know, the, the bees just can't, can't protect it and it gets infested. And then you either end up with an abscond or you end up with a hive just dying out. Um, so for me in my climate where I am, um, it doesn't really work well. But um, I would say if I was anywhere else with uh, um, a nicer climate, I think it would be fantastic. And I had great success with it. Um, I had great success with starter strips of foundation. And um, I also did wedges. I did my wedges a little bit differently. Uh, since I had a lot of wax laying around, uh, I would dip my wedges completely in wax and that gives them, and then I would turn the wedge on end, um, and nail it back to the frame. Um, and they would always build down from that wedge. Um, I really liked it. So that, that's kind of my experience and, and what I did with foundationless and, and, uh, and, and starter strips. I really liked it. Um, it just doesn't really work for me where I am just because of the heat and, and the, the type of honey crops that we get in. They're just, they're so large. It just, it just doesn't really work. And I, I even tried, um, I'm not sure if you've seen Don, the fat bee man or, um, Ken Davis here in Oklahoma does, does it, but, um, basically you cut a, a sheet of foundation in half and, uh, use fishing line to make an X throughout the frame, kind of like a, a wiring situation. And even with that support, I'd still have collapsed combs. So anyway, that's kind of my experience with foundationless. If I, if I could go to it, I'd absolutely go to it. But, um, I'm also kind of working towards, a getting towards, a. we have a lot of, um, pollination opportunities here, uh, where I am. But what I noticed with foundationless is if I went to pick up a box, I, absolutely collapsed comb, especially after, you know, a major honey flow. It just, it happened every time. Um, so, and, and, and I think in a cooler climate, I don't think that would happen, but, um, that's one of the other big reasons I went to plastic was I was able to get the bees to draw it very well, but I don't have to worry about comb collapsing on me in any way, shape or form. Um, and if they get wild comb on it, then I can just scrape it off. So anyway, that's my experience. Uh, yeah, and I don't that's, know if that answered that's, all your questions. No, but. that's great. That's a that's an important thing to remember. I, I keep trying to to teach that all beekeeping is local and the fact that something works for somebody in one place doesn't mean it will necessarily work in another place or even in the same place. Um different things will work differently based on your management style. So keep that Absolutely. in mind. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. Could you talk for me a little bit about your fall splitting process? Here, I don't think that works very well. We don't have any sort of a fall flow as far as I can tell. Um, gotcha. But yeah, go ahead and talk about that a little bit. So we really have, um, we really, when I say we have a fall flow, um, for us, the cotton will start blooming about mid-July. And it'll bloom all the way until they spray it. And that's another another huge thing that we have to worry about where I am is they, they spray defoliant on the cotton to kill it. Um, and 90% of my hives literally sit in cotton fields around here. So I have to constantly worry about my bees getting sprayed. Um, but uh, the way our, our, our flows happen is our fall flow starts, what I call our fall flow, starts with cotton. And that starts in July and last all the way until they spray it or it freezes, which the first freeze is normally like you can always guarantee that October 31st is going to be a really cold day. Like Halloween is the day of the year that everyone around here knows that it's going to get really cold and maybe freeze. So we, we pretty much say that 
the last week of October is, is kind of the end of the season. But leading with cotton, when you hit um, September and October, we also have huge uh, crops of sunflowers that bloom on all of our road edges. Um, we have uh, flowers that are called buttercups, at least that's what I call them. It kind of looks like a sunflower, but it's a single stalk, and it'll have um, 15 to 20 um, yellow flowers that, that bloom on it. And the bees don't get a lot of nectar from it, from what I've noticed, but they get a ton of pollen. Um, but we also have a lot of what we call broom weed, um, which is a, is, it's a very low plant to the ground. Um, and it just makes huge mats of small, tiny yellow flowers. Um, so those are our blooms. And I mean, realistically from July 15th until freeze, we have something blooming somewhere. So the nice thing with that is I have the ability to kind of do a split any time that I want uh, within that time frame. And as long as drones are still flying, especially if I'm trying to get them to raise a queen. Um, but my idea, when, when I do management, I look at how many brood cycles I have until freeze. So the latest I'll do a split um, is August 31st or the end of August, that last week of August. Um, and, and the reason I, I leave that is that gives me about, you know, you're looking at a brood cycle about 21 days, 20, 21 days, depending on temperature around here. So you start looking at how many, you know, months you've got left and you start counting how many brood cycles you've got left. Um, you kind of get an idea of what your hive could develop into within that time frame. But my thing is always, um, especially if I'm allowing them to raise a queen, you've got to remember that from, from the time, time that you do that split, you've got to let probably you're waiting at least 30 days until you start seeing a good lane pattern. You know, and that's one thing I believe is like, yes, some queens will come back from a mating, mating flight and they'll start laying and do really well when they start. But some queens don't hit their stride until, you know, a week or two after they get back from their mating flight where they really start laying well um, or even three weeks. You know, it just takes some time for that queen to kind of get in the in, in the hive too, to, you know, the workers to figure out, you know, this is a new queen, you know, um, and it's it's. To me, I've watched older queens and, and new queens, and it almost looks with the newer, you know, freshly mated queens that, that the workers kind of got to guide them around almost, you know, this go here, go there. Whereas older mated queens, they just, they know exactly what they're doing, and they go from, from cell to cell to cell to cell, and they lay in this beautiful pattern. Whereas younger queens, you know, they'll hit this cell and hit that cell, and they'll have a spotty brood pattern until they really get going. So I kind of base my fall splits not only on how many brood cycles I have, but if I'm raising a new queen, I kind of think about, okay, well, when is she really going to start laying well? And from that day of laying well, which I say is about 45 days from the time I did the split. So that's how I run it on my management practice. So I think from 45 days that I split and let a queen get raised, she'll be laying well and and, and going on from there. So that's how I kind of gauge where I'm going to do my splits. But the nice thing is, is when I do splits in the fall, there's always some type of pollen coming in. But anytime I do splits in the fall, I, I absolutely feed, uh, some type of, of, I either give them a lot of honey or I give them something because I know that my belief is if you artificially create a split, and this is kind of on the, on the, on my, kind of my idea of treatments and, and, and what you're doing is if you do a fall split, you're doing something that's not natural. So if you created something that wouldn't naturally happen within the hive in the fall, then it's your job and your responsibility as a beekeeper to, since you created this happening, it's your responsibility to ensure that the bees have the ample opportunity to survive. So, I feed when I do fall splits. Um, I do fall splits with like a five frame uh, box and um, I put a half gallon jar of syrup on top of them. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of how I run my splits. Um, but uh, does that answer your question? Did you want any more? 
Yeah, Another that's question. good. Do you do you do any sort of queen rearing? Um, so last year I I, I kind of piddled with it. Um, I had some mating nukes, and and basically what I would do is pull just open frames of brood, um, eggs and and fresh larvae, and I would let them raise their own. And um, what I did last year was I built two frame deep. Uh, what I called mating nukes. So it's two deep frames and basically a plywood um, mating nuke. And I had great success with that, but I mainly utilize those queens to um, either requeen these fall splits that I'm making so that they have a queen immediately. Um, I didn't really end up selling many of those. I think I ended up raising maybe 20 to 20 to 30, I'd have to look at my notes, but it, it was pretty successful. I, I believe I had 15 mating nukes and, and they did pretty well. So, so yeah, this year I'm really going to be pushing on raising queens. Um, this year though, um, what I've noticed with, um, with what I want to do with my management is I want to bring some new genetics into my apiary. I believe that's one of the biggest things, um, that a lot of beekeepers, um, you know, everyone, especially kind of in my mentality of, I want local hardy, you know, I, I, you, some people call them survivor stock. Some people, you know, they've made it this far. Their genetics have made it this far. But in that sense too, I like to, this year, I'm going to try to bring in some new genetics into my, into my yards. And the only reason I want to do that is I want to see if it can give me a boost in production in any way, shape or form. Um, so this year I'm going to try buying some queen cells, um, and utilizing those, um, in a yard. But what that allows me to do with queen cells, I don't particularly like buying a whole lot of mated queens because it's a queen that was mated in Georgia or a queen that was mated in California or Texas or wherever. So I truly believe that bees are acclimated to a very specific area if they've been there for several generations. So, a Georgia bee may not do well in Oklahoma as where a Texas bee may, may do well in Oklahoma, or I could order some Kona Queens from Hawaii and they may do really well, but they may not. Um, so at least with the queen cell, I'm at least getting new genetic diversity, but I'm also allowing her to mate locally. So I have new genetic diversity with local adaptation in, in my mind. That's what I'm getting out of it. So this year I'm going to try some queen cells. Um, I haven't, exactly decided on who I'll be getting those from supplier wise, but, uh, I probably need to figure that, figure that out pretty soon before they, everyone gets booked up. <laughs> but, uh, that's, that's what I'm going to be trying this year with queen cells. But, uh, yeah. So I hope that answers that question. Well, before we wrap it up, is there anything that you'd like to tell either backyard beekeepers or maybe backyard beekeepers who are working up to be sideline beekeepers or going in the direction well, that you're going, is there anything you want to communicate to, to those, to people that way? Yeah. So, you know, and of course this is the treatment free, you know, this is your, your channel with treatment free. And, um, I think my biggest thing with being, having success, um, not using any type of medication, um, you know, the only thing I could ever say that I do treatment wise, if, if people want to consider it treatment is, you know, feed and, and do a lot of manipulation, um, but the other thing that, you know, I always like to kind of stress too, is if you, if you ever look at Dr. Tom Seeley's work out of Cornell and, and his other work, you'll find that most bees like to find a cavity that's, you know, around 40 liters. And, um, so if you think about it in terms of what that means for the bees, when we put them in a double deep with two mediums on top. We're actually put them in, in a much larger cavity than they're probably used to in a natural environment. You know, they're natural. They like to be around 40 or, or larger in 40 liters or larger in capacity for their, their hive to be made in. And, uh, so what I always try to stress is you've got to remember that you're probably artificially creating a much larger space for bees to live in than they're used to. Um, and, uh, I think one of the biggest things that I did to be really successful my second and third year, and I didn't really get into this, was I really like to break down hives uh, in the winter into as small of a space as possible. 
Um, but I also like to leave a lot of ventilation. And I think this is where a lot of winter kills come from is there's this massive colony that is within this huge nest, you know, two, three, four boxes high. Well, you have a lot of heat that is, you know, near the cluster, but then you have heat rising onto a huge cold pocket of air near the top of the, the top of the hive. So you end up with a lot of condensation and humidity in the hive. And I think that's where a lot of, of dead outs happen in the winter. Um, at least that's what I've seen. I mean, I've opened my larger hives in the winter and I've actually seen water condensation on the, you know, the top of the hive, the, the lid, um, and also on, on the outsides of frames. Um, so, um, I think one of my biggest things is, you know, you, you've got to look at your management practice in terms of, is this natural for the bees for me to be doing it this way? Or did I artificially change something that normally wouldn't happen in the bees life cycle? Like if you do a fall split, um, you know, around here, swarms slow down after around June. So, I mean, there, there's, there's abscons and, and we have huge abscons that happen down here and during the cotton flow because, you know, you end up with wild colonies that have honey that collapses and they just abscond and you end up with this 10 pound swarm hanging out of someone's tree. Um, but, uh, I think one of the biggest things of just being a backyard beekeeper is especially my first year, I think, I think with backyard beekeeping, a lot of people either get packages or get nukes. And you have to remember with a package, you have a swarm. And a lot of times packages are delivered at times when there is barely a nectar flow starting. You know, um, maybe that's not how it is where everyone else is, but we can get packages as early as March. And the pollen is just kind of in, in a flow is just starting here. And you have three pounds of bees and a queen and, and they have nothing to start with. And then you just some people like to feed and some people don't. But I think one of the biggest things that was successful for me when I first got a lot of my hives was I fed them till the point I knew that they would survive. And I, I think uh, I think you can feed honey um, as long as you have honey from a reputable source or it's your own honey. That's one huge thing that um, I think some people get into is, oh, well, I don't want to feed them sugar, so I'll feed them honey and they'll go out and buy honey from, you know, hopefully not Walmart or anywhere, but you, you never know what's in there. You could have foul brood. You could have all kinds of diseases within that. Um, so if you're going to feed honey, uh, which I do, um, I open feed my honey, um, uh, cappings and everything else back to my bees um, after I'm done with it because I know it came from mine. Um, but uh, I'd really uh, stress that for new beekeepers, feed them till the point you know they're going to survive. And for everyone, that's different. You know, for me, I like to see an entire deep full worth of, you know, stores, you know, or at least when I break them down in the winter, I want to see four frames on each side. So eight frames of honey and some pollen mixed in there. And then I'll put two frames of brood in the middle. And that's one thing I like to do in the winter is I'll break them back. A lot of my hives back down to single boxes. That gives me a, a much higher honey yield, but they still have 80 pounds worth of honey and the queen still has a little bit of room to uh, crawl for there to also be room for, uh, you know, a cluster. Um, but I think for beginners, just you got to feed them to the point that you know they're going to survive. Don't give them the opportunity to not survive. Um, and then I think for sidelining, the biggest thing that I've done to be successful business-wise to, to get to the point where I'm going from sidelining to commercial was you have to find all of those small little tricks to save you money. Um, you know, like, like I told, mentioned earlier, the 20 cents per frame that you'll save if you wax your own foundation, you know, that doesn't sound like a lot, but if you have, you know, 10 hives and you need 10 new boxes, you're, you're going to start adding up, you know, or you need 20 new boxes That stuff starts adding up and that's money that could be going back into your operation in another way. And I think I think the sidelining side is is really is really just about research. And one of the biggest things that I could say that was successful for me is I bounce a ton of ideas off of uh, my buddy Travis Atkins. Um, I think that's one of the biggest things in the beekeeping 
keeping community is a lot of people that get into it don't have mentors or don't have other beekeepers to bounce ideas off of. You know, hey, what's working for you? And I mean, there's a huge, there's a huge Facebook opportunity. There's a huge, you know, online presence. There's Bee Source, and gosh, there's all kinds of awesome resources out there for you to find information on on how to be successful at beekeeping. But I think it's, I think it's what you said earlier that it's also very localized. What's going to work for you in your local area, and what works for someone in Washington is. It may work for me down here in Oklahoma, but, you know, in my sense of needing to move to Washington, I know that I'm going to probably have an entire different management practice in Washington than I am going to have here in Oklahoma. So those are just some thoughts and ideas, uh, Solomon, that I have. But anyway, uh, yeah, so. Do you have a website or a book or anything you want to promote? Um, I don't have a uh we had a website. I'm still kind of in the midst of working on it. Um, of course, you know, having a full-time job and then doing bees and all, everything else, it's kind of hard to do all that. But uh, I have a Facebook page. Uh, it's Brinks Bees. Um, we also have a YouTube channel under Brinks Bees. We have some um, some good videos on there. Um, I have a video on how to make a, a single deep box with a bottom board and a, a hive top for $20 or less. Um, that's one of my big videos that I like to promote. And, and that's one of the big things I think for beginner beekeepers is just be careful, be careful what you spend money on because you can make a hive out of scrap wood if you want to. Uh, it's not like the bees are going to care the bees don't need the Taj Mahal. They just need a square box that frames are going to fit in and that you can manage well. Um, you know, that may not fall apart in one year. Um, you know, some of my original hives that I built myself my first year were made out of plywood, which a lot of people will shake their head at and, you know, probably yell at me for about, you know, it off gases, horrible things and everything else. But, you know, at that time, I wasn't thinking about those things. I was just thinking about putting bees in a box and keeping them alive. Um, but we have a Facebook page uh, under Brinks Bees and, and a YouTube channel. Um, you can find some great videos on there. I show uh, how we do uh I showed how we do a crush and strain um, extraction straight out of the cotton field, um, all kinds of good stuff on there. So yeah, you can you can find us there. Um, so yeah, that's where you can find us. And and I'm I'm very open. Uh, I love to talk bees. So if anyone has any questions, you're more than welcome to shoot me a message um, on our Facebook page. Um, I, I'd love to to talk. Uh, talk bees so anyone's more than welcome to shoot shoot messages and ask questions so anyway well awesome aaron thanks for joining me on the podcast today solomon thank you so much for the opportunity i, I really enjoyed it i hope uh hope we got to talk about some some good things and maybe some folks got some good information um i try to try to try to be the best beekeeper i can be and and help uh help others where i can so anyway yeah I really appreciate the opportunity to, to be on and I hope, uh, hope it was good for you and, and everybody else. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. I'm going to be coming back and checking this out for, uh, for information on stuff that I want to do in the future. Absolutely. Okay. Fantastic. This has been the Treatment Free Beekeeping Podcast. Thanks for joining me for this episode. If you heard something that was interesting or useful to you, please consider becoming a patron of the podcast starting at a dollar a month or more if you want. So far, I've managed to keep the podcast completely free of advertisements, and I'd like to keep it that way. Your support allows me to continue producing the podcast without having sponsorships, without having to read out advertisements like you hear on many other more commercialized podcasts. You can become a patron at patreon.com slash TFB. And I've just added a new feature to the TFB pub where I'm going to be recording the podcast episodes live so the patrons can watch live. So if you're interested in that, go check it out. If you'd like to see me in person, I have a few events scheduled in 2018. On the 24th of February, I'm going to be doing a beginning beekeeping class here in my home. So listen more for details or check out the events page on Facebook for information on how to sign up for that. I'm also going to be offering the class for a slightly cheaper price online through a live stream, so you can find that there also. And I'll be in Portland speaking to the Portland Urban Beekeepers on 
April 21st in an all-day seminar. No reviews right now. Leave me some reviews and I'll read read them out. Uh, This show is hosted and produced and edited by me, the executive producer is Adam Blitz, and this show is brought to you by him and the other patrons at patreon.com slash tfb. The Treatment Free Beekeeping Facebook group is at facebook.com slash group slash treatment free beekeepers. My helpers there in the administration of that are Tony Holmes, Scott Offord, Michael Cox, moderators are Jason Bruns, Adam Blitz, Ed English, Chris Andrews, Mike Mayhar, and Christina Chilcott. Treatment Free Commercial Beekeepers Group, you can find that on Facebook also. You can find my videos at youtube.com slash treatment free beekeeping. If you get the opportunity, please subscribe to that channel. YouTube is changing their requirements for monetization of their channels, and I need a thousand subscribers, and I'm 150 short, so if you could help me out, that'd be awesome. Treatment Free Beekeeping Forum is at forum.tfbees.net, and the admin, admins there are Dusty and Michael. My website's parkerbees.com, and occasionally I blog at parkerbees.blogspot.com. Thanks for joining me. Please share and rate this podcast whenever you get a chance. It helps other people learn about the podcast and learn about treatment free beekeeping. Theme music is by Jeb Bodiford. Credits music is by Nikolai Haidless. And have fun keeping bees, because if you're not having fun, you probably should do something else. <laughs>